we are going to be 10 billion by 2050. We are going to live on a planet four degrees hotter. We are going to have more mouths and less food. We are going to have less land and more pollution. But we crossed oceans and we defeated diseases. But we went to the moon and we blossomed the desert. Because we are innovators. We are farmers. We are makers. We are dreamers. And we are going to gather and discuss, create and inspire minds and souls. Because we are feeding our future. Buongiorno a tutti, sono Cristian Giuseppe Marmorio, ho 18 anni e frequento il quarto anno come tecnico della ristorazione presso il CFP Centro Padre Pia Marta Milano. Durante il mio percorso scolastico ho affrontato diversi stage, eh, riuscendo a vedere e toccare anche con mano il chilometro zero e vedendo anche diverse tipologie di cucina, come passando da una cucina classica a una creativa in centro Milano per finire anche in una cucina in Spagna. Il mio obiettivo e sogno è quello di riuscire a unire le mie due passioni, ovvero i motori e la cucina, in un'unica attività, perché queste due passioni per me vogliono dire tanto e i motori vogliono dire velocità e rischio, mentre la cucina ha delicatezza e serietà a testa. Good morning, my name is Henry Gordon Smith and I'm co-founder of the Association for Vertical Farming. And I'm Penny McBride, co-chair of the research Div division for the association. Welcome to Feeding the Cities, special conference in partnership with Seeds and Chips. Today, we've invited 15 of our most innovative speakers to talk to you today. Everything from advanced lighting systems to specialized biological solutions for indoor farms. To home plant machines and high-tech control systems to sensors and new disruptive ideas for farming on Mars. And rooftop farms and plant factories. So we want you to listen up and be inspired today as we hear from 15 innovators from across the world. Good morning, everybody. A heartily cordial welcome uh, to this wonderful conference, the first cooperation for us with seats and chips, and we are very happy and honored to be here today. To go, to start a topic, food innovation, I always like to go back into history, and the short history of human species is printed and is, uh, is really uh, shaped by food, by the food topic. Without food, we couldn't live. Food is essential and existential to us. It connects us but it also divides us, because some of us have food in abundance, 
but millions of us still go to bed hungry. So, what can vertical farming do about it? We have developed from, from hunters to farmers and now to food technologists. We print food in 3D printers. We design and develop food with new proteins and we grow food in vertical farms. Controlled, controlled environment agriculture is the knowledge and provides us with the technology. The technology which makes us independent to grow food in a controlled environment from season, climate, day and night, sun and rain. First time in human history we are on this level of independency and it's needed because climate change, urbanization rates, population growth all need these solutions to be more independent from natural disasters as we can see it around the world. We at the AVF are the only worldwide active nonprofit organization which is active in this field. We are a platform. We connect people. We provide a network for universities, companies, and we also look into standardization. We push forward the development of the industry, which is still nascent, but which is on the brink of a food revolution. Vertical farming in the world is a global um, movement, as we can see at the moment. And we have to use this technology wisely. We have to really consider, is it just a technology or is it in our hands to change problems and maybe even to solve some of the problems of hunger and malnutrition? It is up to us what we do with it. And we at the AVF have a close look at a sustainable development of vertical farming. And I all invite you to be part of this. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thank you to be here. I'm very happy to be here with you. And I am, I'm very happy you are in Milan. That is um, a wonderful city. One of the Italian beautiful city, but with some uh, differences. First of all, because we are a real international city. And second, because we are a contemporary city. So you can live a city where you can perceive uh, the history, the art, architecture, but also it's like to be on uh, a window in the future. And that is the reason for which I'm very happy to be here with you. And I'm uh, very happy to address uh, this audience uh, um, and open a debate uh, on something that uh, matters a lot for us. No matter who we are, where we live, what we do, but the issues related to food and the way we eat are fundamental for our well-being and mainly in the city and the, in the urban area across the globe. This is um, for the simple reason that you know currently more than half of the world growing population lives uh, in cities, but by 2050, seven people out of 10 are expected to live uh, in cities. So we are demanded uh, to take action and to define uh, a new strategy for the urban uh, food system. And now, my city, Milan, has uh, a long-standing tradition of agricultural practices and a strong linkage with the rural areas. So we have a sort of a vocation to innovate and we, we want to win this fight, the fight to be uh, a, a city where new solutions and enough innovation can offer us opportunities. What we are doing, a city of Milan, 
we acted, we are acting at different levels. For instance, through the participation to the different EU smart project, past year we were awarded by 6 million euros for a project called Open Agri. It is a project for which we will create an open innovation hub on peri-urban agriculture. This project was presented to the European Commission by us, and we got uh, this result. So we are uh, starting now with the activities uh, and working with, uh, I mean, having in mind the, that economic innovation, technology, and urban innovation, and social inclusion may be an opportunity for us. This was the crowning success uh, of our roadmap uh, for bringing innovation in our urban food farming, farming system. But let me underline some uh, more action we, we took. First, uh, the foundation of DAM Consortium, the so-called uh, Distretto Agricolo Milanese, since uh, 2011, a new model of territorial gover governance aimed at developing a locally embedded agricultural production through the valorization of local farms and the quality of landscape. Second, and that is fundamental, the posting of guidelines and public announcement for farmers' markets, ethical purchasing groups, and share vegetable gardens. So we are offering, offering the possibility to stay in the city, to have spaces in the city, and to open uh, um, farmers' market. Third, the implementation of uh, a strategic plan to recover 16 old historical and abandoned rural farmhouses in our territory. Fourth, Alimenta to Talent, a program to support innovative startups like, I mean, your startups in the full farming sector and in the sector of the science of life. Then fifth, the publication in uh, 2015 uh, uh, during the Expo, the Universal Exposition, of the Food Policy Guideline 2015-2020 and the launching of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, joined so far 140 cities. And currently, the first edition of Milan Food City. So we are here. We, we are living a week uh, that is featuring uh, public discussions, conferences, events. So we want to make uh, this experiment this year in order to relaunch uh, in 2018. So I'm sure that um, Marco Gualtieri will do even, even more on the, on the following uh, year, in 2015 and 2019. But we, we, we want to get this opportunity to work on these uh, fundamental issues, that is food for our city. Thank you very much. Buongiorno. Good morning. We've got to move quickly, so I will start with the fact that I don't have a clicker, but that's okay, because I can just say, next slide, please. Maybe I do have a clicker. <laughs> Thank you. So we have some local heroes to recognize, and of course, Leonardo da Vinci is the biggest hero, and even he was concerned with food. He was an innovator. And when we look at what he observed and then designed and then built, and from there we built a model and then an operational model, and finally we're now hang gliding off cliffs, we're even throwing ourselves off cliffs in our squirrel suits. All this started with inspiration from nature. We're now designing three-dimensional machines based on octopi. How remarkable is that? So if we look for our inspiration from nature, the grandest design that nature has to provide to us is the ecosystem. 
It's taken us a long time to understand how an ecosystem works. But once that knowledge was acquired, it was obvious that food is the essence for describing how ecosystems work. The sun shines, the grass grows, the animals eat the grass, the other animals eat the animals, the animals eat the animals that eat the grass. Eventually everything dies, it recycles. How remarkably simple and yet how remarkably complex. So here we find ourselves living in cities without a clue as to how to proceed. Of course, Dr. Mayor Sala has a clue, he has a big clue. He has chosen to wrap himself around technology and the future. And is that, that is what most cities need to do. So as we now look at the way cities compare to ecosystems, we see a missing component. It's food. We have nothing to uh, encourage cities to behave as independent units like ecosystems behave. Why? Because there is no base for the ecosystem that we are creating by living inside cities. So we need to mimic nature. And in doing so, we can find ourselves now resilient, redundant, biodiverse, balanced, and sustainable, just like nature. And to do that, we recycle water, we capture energy passively, we grow our own food, we create livable mass transit, we create energy from waste. And that is the essence of an ecosystem. And that is what we need to become if we are to sustain ourselves into the next millennium. We are making progress, of course. We see essence of food production in cities. Gotham Greens is a good example, but there are others too. In fact, they're expanding from New York into Chicago. We look to the north in the United States, into Canada. It's freezing cold in Montreal, and yet they're growing food on rooftops. Everybody's benefiting from that. If we were to increase the size of these structures and make them larger, we could increase the density of the food without increasing the footprint. And that is the essence of vertical farms. And here is the result of just 10 years worth of progress. It is now a global contest to see who can do it best. Here is a partial list of organizations that claim to be vertical farms because they grow food in tall buildings within the cities. This is the vision of the future. We can do this because of technology. The technology of LED lights has advanced remarkably over the last 10 years to allow us to do this cheaply and efficiently anywhere we want. So we can bring the sun inside, essentially. And we can do this because of advances at companies like Philips that announced in one day the efficiency of LED lights went from 28% efficient to 60% efficient. That is in one single day. Imagine how much energy that saved as a result of that breakthrough. These are breakthroughs that are still continuing. We don't just talk about food either. We talk about raising other products inside of these large structures in which plants are the basis for the production of insulin. Factor nine, in case you're suffering from hemophilia, we can actually engineer plants to produce rubber if that's what we want. We can do whatever we wish. The question is, what do you want? And when do you want it? What do you want your city to look like 100 years from now? The biggest question of that, of course, is if you were 100 years earlier in your life and you were asked that same question, could you have predicted all of this innovation and technology? And of course you couldn't. But the real question is, what do you want your city to look like 100 years from now? What do you want it to be? Because you're in control. You're not just sitting there doing nothing. You are engineering the future. And that's what the most remarkable part of this whole thing is. Look what's happening now in Shanghai. Shanghai wants to become the epicenter for training people how to grow food in cities. And Shanghai won't be the only place for this, I guarantee you, but they're setting the tone. There are other places too, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. What a remarkable structure this will be if it ever gets made. I would like to live in it. I want to surround myself with food and good life. And we're training the next generation. Here's a school in New York City, for instance, that uses a high-tech greenhouse with hydroponics 
as their training center for mathematics, science, technology, and engineering. It's all in one building, and they're using the growth of plants and fish to teach about the world. So the big question is, what will it look like? We have some choices here, of course. We can pick the crowded, dirty, dark city of the future that video games offer us. Or we can pick the one that we've seen on television, watching the Jetsons misbehave using protein pills as food. I don't pick that one either. I pick something else. I pick a city that's livable, that encourages me to have children, that encourages my children to have children. These are the futurists. They are inventing it as we speak. They will be next year's presenters. Here's an entire engineering unit for 8th grade to 12th grade as to how to engineer a vertical farm. Last year, that did not exist. So in the end, we want to farm smart. Henry going to love me for this because I'm almost finished. How do we farm smart? We hire companies like IKEA that teaches us how to do that. And they don't teach us, they teach our children. And then our children teach us. So, in the end, if we are to survive, we have to encourage the rest of the world to come back. We have taken it away with cutting down forests and planting crops. We need to stop doing that. We need to live in the future. And the future is basically our, our natural past. If you want to learn more about this, of course, there are resources available out there. So thank you very much. Um, I believe insects should also be part of uh, sustainable ecosystems. Um, I'm Jonathan Koppert. Um, I work for Bestico. Bestico is an organization dedicated to the production of insects for feed and food. Um, Bestico is part of a much larger organization called Coppert Biological Systems. Coppert Biological Systems is a uh, company which is uh, dedicated to the production of insects for biological control in horti and agriculture. Now, I'm proud to announce that this year um, we can celebrate our 50 years of insect innovation. Now, what is the problem? The problem is that currently a lot of fish in uh, countries like Peru, Peru and Chile are uh, being caught to produce fish meal. This fish meal is being transported to Europe to use as a component in fish feed. Now with the growing demand for, um, with the growing demand for, for, sustain, for fish and um, high quality proteins, this will be in the future an unsustainable concept. It has proven and tested that insects can be a viable solution to substitute part of this fish meal. And I'm also proud of our European Commission, which um, recently um, changed the law so we can regularly use insect meal in, aqua feed in the aqua feed sector. But there's more. There's also an abundance of biomass, food waste, agricultural waste, which is currently not being used to its maximum potential. It is used to generate biogas, to burn, or to, or to compost. But I believe after, after preventing food waste, the best thing to do is to feed it to insects or other animals. But insects have the potential, insects have the potential to, to generate even more value to that. They, they are uh, fast converters and they can eat around plastic parts and uh, glass parts, which makes it a, a um, safe solution. So how do we do this? We have developed a fully automated insect farm, which basically is kind of a vertical farm in itself. You have to imagine thousands of trays moving automatically through the building, facilitating the growth of billions of insects. The concept encompasses a total of um, sourcing the feedstock, developing the diet, making sure the automation is right, making sure the climate control is right, harvesting techniques, and also processing techniques to process these insects into insect proteins and fats. 
Now, I believe that this could be a viable solution for large cities all over the world. The only condition is that we have access to biomass. And this, for this access, we, we need the help of governments, institutions, and also industrial partners. At the same time, there's, I see integration possibilities with other vertical farming concepts. We can use the biofertilizers which come out of the produ insect production farm to grow crops on. And at the same time, the insect protein can be used in aquaponic systems or urban fish farms. So to conclude, feeding fish to fish is an unsustainable concept. Biomass can be utilized better by feeding it to insects. The technology is ready to scale up production of insects. And I believe, based on our 50 years of experience, that insects is not a hype, but that they are here to stay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Timo. I work for ASRAM as an innovation manager. And um, my dip today's talk is um, in uh, collaboration with my uh, with a strategic partner of our company, um, with Agrolution. It's a divided talk. And we will talk about this appliance you see here in the back of me. This is a smart kitchen home appliance where you can grow different food. Um, before that, I would to like to start with something. What you see on the screen is just an LED. But this LED disrupted very heavily the, uh, the uh, lighting industry. And it has also a big influence on the whole horticulture and agriculture industry. I will come back to this later. What we are currently seeing is, for all industries, on um, the topic of IoT. To this audience, it is totally known. Um, but it has also a big influence on the whole agriculture industry. What we are currently seeing, that agriculture is going more and more indoors, into greenhouses and into vert vertical farms. And these um, environments are totally controlled environments, where you try to, to measure everything with sensors and to control every, everything with actuators. And one integral part of it is light. Because with light, you can influence this, by the way, is a cucumber plant growing on, from, from left to right under different spectra and from below to down um, with different intensity. And what you see that the crops look totally different. So what you can do with light, you can influence the quantity, so the yield, the quality, so the nutrient content and also the taste, but also the whole growing cycle, so the cycle time and the appearance. So, this, the slogan of our company is Light is Osram. So, if, if we as a company take this serious, then we have to say Osram loves horticulture because light is such an integral part of it. And the, there are different, um, yeah, um, different segments for the whole um, controlled environment agriculture. So, we see, um, yeah, in, in the talk of Dixon, when it's integrated into skyscrapers, we see vertical farms, we see greenhouses, container farms, but also uh, farms very close to re related to, to um, um, restaurants and uh, supermarkets and so on. And there's also a segment smart gardening. And in this regard, um, so we as Osram, we are, we are known for producing these LED, LED chips for horticulture. But we want to do more, so we try to organize ourselves like a startup to help this market to get mature and to, to get our footprint into this market. So we are developing a research line to develop light recipes for different, different crops. Um, we are in, in the greenhouse business and, and then also developing different applications for food-related business. And one project we are doing is with Agrolution in the field of smart gardening. So this is a, a project we, we really like very much um, because it's like a small vertical farm. So you can simulate very fast a lot of thing in a very small chamber and later on scale it. And this is a, something um, which is, a, we think, a very good approach, um, how you learn fast, being agile, being lean, 
And this is something which is, for a company like Azram, not so easy. We are known to produce in volumes. In volumes? Oh, sorry. Uh, in volumes. So this is something where we try to find a startup approach, working together with Acolution, and um, yeah, to tackle the smart gardening market. So the next speaker after me will, will be the CEO. And, and we want to show this as a, uh, as a case study, how multinational collaborates with a startup. Good morning, everyone. So Timo already gave you the introduction. My name is Max, uh, one of the co-founders of Agrilution. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about our smart kitchen appliance that we've developed. It's a, it's a smart home appliance that comes with um, automated watering, climate control, and LED lighting. And, and especially the lighting part is where we have the strategic partnership with Osram. And um, the, the system is designed in a way that you can basically grow anything. Uh, at market entry now, we're starting with a variety of 30 different crops. And you can grow eight of these at a time in the device. The device is really the first uh, plug-in grow device out there. It makes it easy for anyone to grow food even without a green thumb. Um, but we haven't just developed this hardware appliance. Um, it's part of a, a, a larger ecosystem. And the ecosystem is, is what makes the whole thing intelligent and work together. So there's an, an app that comes with it, as well as a, as a refill system. So our consumable system um, is made out of an organic biodegradable substrate that comes with pre-planted seeds. And you basically get shipped these mats in your uh, mailbox. And then you just put it in the device. It auto automatically recognizes what you planted and then takes care of the entire growing process for you. And that way, you can't really fail. So even people that have um, basil plants on their windowsill and make them die after two, three days, um, even you will succeed. So it comes with an app that basically lets you remote monitor and control what you're growing. It has a store integrated. Uh, we give recipe suggestions. You can interact with us. So it's basically also a, a way to, yeah, for if you have questions or um, uh, if you want to share something through social media with other people that are using the device or with your friends and family. Um, and it's a tool to basically learn and contribute. We're also bringing these devices into kindergartens and schools now in Germany starting this year, and we have a collaboration there with the German Aerospace Agency. So, but like the, the focal point of this ecosystem is the produce, the food that you want to grow, right? So we're starting with uh, 24 to 30 now. Um, the cool thing is that the plants taste fresher, they're more intense. Um, on average, they have a higher nutrient content than what you buy in a normal supermarket because it's extremely fresh and it doesn't have to be transported. Um, another highlight is that the plants that we can grow, they're not, they don't have to be optimized for storage or for being transported. So you can really optimize for taste and nutrients. Um, the device is about the size of, of a yeah, I would say a dishwasher, a standard European size dimensions. You can integrate it into a kitchen or use it standalone. Um, and it feeds a family of a small family, so two and a half people. Um, the plants grow using controlled environment agriculture technology, so they grow two to three times faster than outside in nature. And obviously, we use a lot less water and fertilizer. Um, you don't need a, a fixed um, water connection, there is a water reservoir in the system, and all you need is electricity, basically. So, um, as Timo mentioned, we have a strategic partnership, um, and it's something that we've thought a lot about. I mean, I've been doing this for five years now, and we always wanted to stay away from the big guys to be lean and agile, um, but it's actually helped us tremendously, and especially um, what I'd like to highlight is that since even though it's a multinational that we're collaborating with, uh, Timo's 
business department is really behaving like a small startup. So they're agile. Um, another benefit is that they're very close to us. We're located in Munich, Germany, and their headquarters is there as well. We have access to their entire uh, development team. They have new horticulturalists that are working with them now. We have access to their patent um, attorneys. So it's really a, a partnership that's helped both of us as a multinational can learn from the fast development pace of a startup and the other way around we can really make use of all the benefits that a multinational has to offer and experience. Thank you very much for the attention. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Gonzalo. Uh, I'm the CEO at Cool Farm. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about our vision uh, for the future of city farming. Uh, so, okay, we got it right now. Uh, so, Cool Farm is a tech company that operates in the indoor farming market space. Uh, we launched our flagship product, the Cool Farm In Control, last year. It's basically a cloud based artificial intelligence control system for indoor farming. So, basically designed for greenhouses or large scale warehouses. And yes, there's also an app for that. So what we envision uh, for the future is, uh, uh, of cities and, and city farming in specific uh, is a future where your food is grown where you purchase it. A future where chefs can cook with food that was produced hyper-locally, so food that was produced inside the restaurant. A future where even the most remote resorts can have freshly food always available for, for consumption of their highest demanding customers, a future of truly scalable, modular, vertical farming solutions where there is zero miles for your food, uh, where we can reduce the costs of the total operation, uh, and when we can produce more per square feet. So we actually materialized this concept. We call it the Cool Farm Instar. We presented it earlier this year in March in Germany. Uh, it's basically a large fridge-like uh, vertical container uh, where you can actually grow a huge amount of greens in a small footprint. Uh, by by uh, producing it earlier, uh, and it gave us the ability to actually talk uh, to potential customers, to the people who are actually using this in the near future, to get feedback of what they thought about the idea, how they see themselves using it, how, and how can this solution actually impact the future of food productions inside our cities. So the Instar is basically a large climatic chamber. Uh, it's actually being built by a partner right here in Milano, Travaglini, a company with 70 years of experience in climate control. Uh, we have full control over the climate with uh, very little difference throughout the whole vertical distribution. Then we fill out the chamber uh, with a series of, of, of uh, trays where we produce the greens. And in essence, we use an automated elevator system to actually bring the, the, the greens to the operator down. So the idea here is to allow the, the farmer to actually take full potential of a, a vertical farming solution, having as high density of, of greens in, in as such a small space as possible, uh, without all the hassle and the troubles of actually having to operate a vertical farm. And those of you who already have the opportunity to work in a vertical farm know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, finally, of course, we wrap everything up beautifully with the in-control system that makes this possible, has the, the density of plants is extremely high, and there is actually no human intervention inside of the, of the growth chamber. Okay, so uh, basically this is what we envision for the, the, the future of city farming, uh, a truly flexible, modular, scalable solution. Uh, the system can be used standalone, uh, or it can also be used in a cluster of, of uh, multiple instars. The system is also scalable vertically, which means that you can, you can purchase a base system and then make it higher according to the vertical space that you have. So the idea here is that we can grow as much food as possible in the smallest footprint possible. At the end of the day, Cool Farm's vision for the future is not only to provide 
simply technology, but to provide solutions to help the farmers of today feed the cities of tomorrow. So thank you all for listening. Vertical farming shows us the way to go, namely up, both in terms of stacking the plants and in terms of uh, increasing the yield of food. But if you stack plants in racks like this, they're bound to shade each other. You get limited to artificial light, more or less, and that limits you to lettuce and artificial herbs and, and uh, medicinal herbs until now. This shows you how a mirror can be arranged, can be so shaped that sitting above a vertical farm, it shines light straight down wherever the sun can possibly come from. We do have models also that will shine light in from the sides, but they're not on display here. These models are available, and you can come and look at this on our stand at B33. The next two pictures were taken one minute apart last December 3rd in London at sunset. That shows what's happening to the sun. It's a quarter to four on December the 3rd. You look up at the sky above you, sitting underneath the mirror, and there you have, you now have the light coming straight down at midsummer intensity at sunset at midwinter. It can be done. Now, the last of my slides, and I'm very short, I'm quite sure I'm less than five minutes. <laughs> the last of my slides shows a model that we received actually just 24 hours before setting off for Milan. So we haven't got a very clever pictures of it, but it shows the point. Here are three different colored lasers shining on mirrors, on skylights arranged above uh, a vertical farm, and the light is coming down between the plants and can be redistributed to where the plants are. The thing is functional now, and I just hope that people will come and take an interest, play with our models. What we're here for, we're looking for partners, collaborators, investors, and that's why we're here, and I hope we're going to find them here in Milan. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming out. My name is uh, Martin Veenstra. I'm from Holland. I work for the company Surfon, and I title this slide Surfon uh, 365. It's because what we're doing as a company is uh, living and breathing horticulture 265 days in a year for already quite a long time. A little bit of an introduction about ourselves, I'll try to keep it short. We've been around since uh, around uh, 1896, so we've got about 120 years of history under our belt in, in, in horticulture in the Netherlands and worldwide. We're based in the Netherlands, and um, we've got a lot of different disciplines uh, within our company, ranging from construction of um, greenhouses, uh, heating, cooling, electrical engineering, irrigation technology, and of course also lighting systems. And just to give you a quick overview, uh, we've got a nice mix in the demographic within uh, our people, a lot of experience in there with a lot of years of horticultural experience under their belt, mixed with some fresh new people, which we part of as well. Um, looking forward into the future to see what innovations will be coming our way in the field of, uh, of horticulture and also vertical farming. The world is our playground. We, uh, we operate uh, globally from east to west and north to south. And um, we're doing that together and for a large number of, uh, of, of partners and, uh, and clients, which are really, really valuable in um, uh, staying uh, an innovative comp uh, company throughout the, all these, uh, these many years. We've been talking about vision a lot, and we have a very clear vision at Surfon. We, we, we strive for year-round available, fresh, clean and healthy food. And the way we do this is um, looking at the, the food production market from really a, uh, a return on investment uh, perspective. So we are used to working for, for growers and producers who want to build a, um, a, a 
basically a profitable business in growing food and supplying um, um, their clients with, uh, with, with healthy and, 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 and clean food. And that means really an integrated approach from basically seeds entering in a, in a production facility, whether it's a greenhouse or a vertical farm, right up until the point where it gets distributed either by truck or very close or even inside the city. Browsing through very quick examples for us, producing uh, food efficiently can be in greenhouses. We've been doing that for, for, for many years. It's still a very efficient way to grow large volumes of food for a large number of people. Um, typically highly automated to make efficient use of space. Additional lighting like growing uh, uh, tomatoes and increasing productivity there. But, of course, what the focus mainly is on here, something we've been doing for many years already, is building vertical farms with an optimum efficiency for, for example, here, a producer of lettuce who is uh, propagating lettuce plants in order to um, really cut down propagation time and uh, optimize the space efficiency. That's around 4,000 square meters on a very small footprint, which is only about a fifth of the total space. But also potted plants, you know, we're also innovating there. These are a type of orchids, which, in which by going vertical, we're saving one on production time because of the lighting strategies and the climate controls, and also um, the energy use is uh, much uh, lower. And I'll just very quickly flip to what we're doing in the future, for example, directly producing at the, the food processors uh, to prolong shelf life, and a real next step will be we think uh, not maybe in the very near future, but definitely soon um, also producing uh, uh, fruiting crops like um, uh, tomatoes and cucumbers, etc., in completely closed and controlled environments. Now, this is not something for today yet. This is still very energy intensive, but we're getting there. We're growing these tomatoes uh, already in a completely controlled environment, and we're doing that by uh, designing our own technologies, having our own agronomists on staff, and really looking forward into the future to see where it will lead us in producing healthy, safe food year-round, worldwide. Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice. Uh, thanks for, for being here. Um, my name is Gus Vanderfels, responsible for vertical farming at Philips. And what I want to talk to you is about our vision for vertical farming, how it is also becoming a reality actually already today. Uh, on the picture you see the facility that we have in, uh, in, in Eindhoven, the GrowWise Center, where we are actually growing plants every single day, working with our customers to prove that there are very viable business models for vertical farming that can be commercially used. Of course, it begins with a vision. Philips Lighting as a company has been around for 125 years and we've been leading the, the way in lighting ever since. Uh, and also we have a vision for what the world will look like in the future. Actually, we're not even looking ahead that far, only 15 years or so, 2030, around that time, when we believe that smart cities will be essential to the way we live, where we also, uh, to the, the, the points that Dixon Despomier made, the world is more people, people living closer together, and we'll need to use smart and efficient ways of working together. Part of that will be vertical farming, where we already see that customers and consumers need access to more, fresher, cleaner, and healthier vegetables, things that you're comfortable feeding to your children, not just having enough food, but also having good food. V vertical farming is a way to do this, and of course, we've already seen a lot, lot of people discuss this and, and talk to you about that today. Uh, and in tomorrow's smart cities, this will be a part of the infrastructure. Best quality vegetables growing close to people's homes, in a very efficient and a sustainable manner. And actually, we've made a nice video about it. I don't have the time to show it here, but if you take a picture, you can look it up. It's on YouTube, the 2030 uh, Smart City Life video that we have. Um, cool to watch. We're actually realizing that vision today. We're working on it. We have our own facilities. We have Grow Eye Center, where the lighting is quite important, of course, but also the way you use it. What, you, what can you use lighting for? That's also why we engage in discussion with um, what we call from seed to supermarket. On one hand, with the seed growers, the people that develop the, the, the varieties that we will be using in tomorrow's vertical farms. And on the other hand, we want to talk to consumers and retailers and understand what they need, where the market is going, where the world is going, and how we can help them 
realize their needs. Um, working in growers, and actually what you see here is one of my colleagues presenting one of the crops that we've grown indoor uh, in, in Eindhoven. Uh, growing healthy crops of very, very high quality, very high freshness, and uh, wonderful shelf life. We've done tests on this, um, actually together with uh, our joint customer with, uh, with Sertan Stai Food Group. They have actually uh, tried our crops that we've grown for them in, uh, in our trials at GrowWise. We've seen that the bacterial contamination is two to three orders of magnitude lower than what you would expect from any other form of growing. We've also shown that the shelf life actually is more and more than sufficient for a commercial application. Also expecting them to reduce the waste by 50 to 60 percent. Um, also, of course, what we do, we work with the seed growers and with our customers to select the best varieties that have the best possible performance in an indoor farm. So if you look at it, the technology for the job is there. There are great lighting solutions that we help develop and we continue to develop going forward. But we also work very closely with our partners around the world to make sure that we build commercial solutions for vertical farms. Yes, yeah. Um, so actually, if you look at it, vertical farming is happening today. Projects are there. The projects are getting bigger. The projects are also commercially viable. Um, and we're also seeing this in the business case that we work on with our customers. Tangible projects that are happening. A couple of examples. Uh, Martin already uh, talked about uh, Fresh Care Convenience at Stye Food Group. They've run the numbers, they're making the investment, and they will be producing for German supermarkets at the end of this year, early next year. Similarly, we do projects in London, in Japan, in the Netherlands, uh, but also in, in the North America, in, for instance, in Canada, northern Canada, where the winters are long, where the, uh, the supply chains are long, and good quality vegetables are more difficult to get, uh, and therefore it makes sense to also produce them locally using a vertical farm. So we're actually seeing that retailers, distributors, and growers are stepping in. Um, the ship is leaving. We are there. It's viable. It's there. It's happening. We're very, very excited as Philips to be part of that and to be also part of leading that transition and making it happen for uh, many of our customers around the world. So also, if there's anybody out there for you guys that are looking for what do I need to do, where do I start, look us up. We're here. We're going to be there for, uh, we're going to be around as well. And very, very happy to help you. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, before I start, I think everybody at the conference understands that this cannot be how we feed the world, right? This is the industrial food system. It ships in high calorie, low nutrient food from thousands of miles away. And the results, especially in my adopted country of the USA, are awful. Obesity, diabetes, impact to the planet, a loss of community around food. But here's what's happening, right? The consumer is demanding a real food revolution. The consumer has lost trust in that industrial food system. They don't know their farmer. They don't know where the food is coming from. But they see those terrible results. And they want change, right? People want to know their farmer so they can trust their food. And of course, as we know, these people increasingly live in cities, right? This is what the world looks like in 2050. These people need feeding, they want to know their farmer, they want real food. So all of this creates a massive opportunity here, an opportunity that is bigger than the internet, we think. This is my co-founder, Kimball Musk, right? This is an opportunity for a whole new generation of entrepreneurs, those who understand urban agriculture, those who understand local food systems, and very importantly, those who understand the importance of people and farmers and relationships in the food transaction, because it's relationships with people that bring trust and transparency to the food that people want. And this is why we set up Square Roots. So the idea with Square Roots is very simple. We want everybody to know your farmer, and we want to do that in the middle of our biggest cities and we want to do that absolutely everywhere so that everyone has access to local, real food where they have a relationship with their local farmer. Now, how do we do that? Well, the first thing that you have to do is build farms in the middle of the city. This is ours. Our first one opened in November last year. This is in Brooklyn, New York. These are controlled climate hydroponic farms that are literally dropped right in the middle of the neighborhood next to people that want to eat the food. 
These allow us to grow year-round, GMO-free, pesticide-free, beautiful, nutritious food. But honestly, the most important bit is that we also need an army of entrepreneurial-minded farmers. Remember, people want food that they can trust, and they want a relationship with the farmer. And so we set up Square Roots as a platform to enable us to empower a whole new generation of these entrepreneurial farmers and work with them hand in hand as they tackle this internet-sized opportunity. Farmers like Nabila, for example, she not only takes food to local restaurants, but she takes food to the social web where she has over 30 million views of videos where she's explaining how to grow food in the city, right? This is a woman who was at school six months ago and has been working with Square Roots in that time. Or farmers like Paul. Paul's customers willingly overpay for his greens so that at the weekend he can distribute discounted produce to low-income housing areas across New York. This is a social entrepreneur in a box. We have farmers like Eric and Josh and Electra, and we can go on and on here. These are 10 farmers that are part of the first cohort of Square Roots entrepreneurial farmers, and they're all growing food and selling food in New York City right now. Now, the food that they're growing is as varied as they are as people, but the business models that they're coming up with are equally impressive. A group of them, for example, have completely reinvented the farmer's market for millennials. They've made it cool again with cocktails and DJs and hundreds of young people coming out on a Monday night to talk with the farmers and buy fresh produce. A number of them also run a program called Farm to Local. This is where a farmer will literally deliver freshly harvested greens directly to your desk at work within two hours of the produce being harvested. You've never tasted anything as fresh in your life. Said another way, this is the way that you used to buy vegetables. It doesn't have to be like that with Square Roots. So our plan now is to replicate this Square Roots program in every city in America so that everyone can know their farmer and have access to local food. And as we do that, some of our farmer entrepreneurs like Max here are enabled to hack on the hardware and tweak the software and make improvements to the system so that we can grow more food with fewer resources and as Max makes one of those improvements in his farm, boom, we can push this out across the whole network so the network of farms that we have here gets stronger the bigger it is. So this is us at Square Roots. We're here to empower the next generation to become leaders in this real food revolution. Thank you very much. Good morning, Milano. My name is Patrick, I'm CEO of Swiss Panic, where we develop technologies to, for urban farming, from personal urban farming to big size, full size vertical farms. So usually, when I, I tell this to people, they stare at me with a big question mark on their forehead. So, let me help you with an example. This one. <laughs> This is my living room. If you just forget for one second the monumental mess that you can see on the right side, just <laughs> take a look at the, on the left side. You can see a closet full of fresh and living vegetables. At Swiss Panic, we are developing the technology to allow everybody, and both people and companies, to create such small ecosystems to grow your food on any scale. This is the big point, because this will bring me to smart cities. Everybody today is, is talking about smart cities, about big data, smart building, smart retail, smart care, smart society, smart homes, smart everything, basically. But let me ask you one thing. How smart is a city if it's not able to feed itself? I believe that a real smart city of the future would, should be able to feed himself, itself. The city must be self-sufficient for energy and food. The food will come from different sources. It will come from the peri-urban farms that will 
enjoy the use of uh, the precision farming that is a big trend right now. It will come from a lot of vertical farms all around the city, a lot of, hopefully. And it will come also from the homes of the people. These three sources will be complementary. And uh, crops will be grown where it's more convenient to be, gro uh, to be grown. What we need today, it's already here. Basically, we need only three main things. We need equipment, we need hardware. We need controllers, we need sensors, we need lights, we need piping, structures, everything. We need a control software that can take care of everything else, that we can take care of all the electronics and make the plants having the best conditions to grow. But the third thing, and maybe the most important one, is the know-how on how to grow the, um, your vegetables. And uh, this is not, it's not that this knowledge is not around, but it's often difficult to reach it or to exchange it. So with AVF, we are trying to improve this situation, let's say. I'm a member of a group, a working group, that is working on a standard recipe format to exchange growth recipes between all the players. This is, will greatly simplify the exchange of this knowledge between university, people, companies. And we believe that this will accelerate the adoption of vertical farming and urban farming all around the world. So, my time is running out here. If you are interested in knowing more about my company or about the program I'm working with, AVF, just please join me after at the AVF Cafe or just send me an email. Thank you very much, everybody. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Good morning. On this day, exactly 72 years ago, the Soviet Union celebrated Victory Day to mark the end of the Second World War. This was the end of the Second World War, but it's also the start of a new war. Uh, the war between East and West, between communism and capitalism. And this brought many disastrous events and bad things, but also something beautiful. It marked the start of a very productive competition called the Space Race, which we just saw. Um, <clears throat> and... Um, Finally, humanity ventured out into the galaxy, first with a dog, um, then people on the moon, rovers on Mars, building an international space station, and last year even putting a lander on a comet going 11 kilometers per second. Now, 50 years, almost 50 years after we first landed, people on the moon, we are considering the moon again. Um, not as a final destination, no, for a place for future settlements, <coughs> future cities, but also as a launch base to explore Mars and beyond. This, however, brings in new challenges, big new challenges, all coming down to how to live outside this planet how to live in space, not just survive there for a few months, but to live there. I'm Tim Hennis, I'm uh, representing Border Labs, which is an open innovation company from the Netherlands, The Hague. And um, we hope with the European Space Agency, which is uh, our partner in this project, to contribute to this quest, which all comes down to how to eat local on Mars. Uh, you've prob you're probably familiar with the Biosphere 2 project in Arizona. It failed miserably. 
It's a project uh, where they try to emulate the Earth's natural resources, uh, uh, Earth's natural systems, aesthetically. So what they did, they put in a mini ocean. They put in a mini desert. And of course, a mini ocean doesn't exist, and a mini desert neither. You know? And it goes especially wrong if you produce, put those two together under one roof. Our partner uh, in, our, in the project is the Melissa Consortium, which is headed by the European Space Agency. They take another approach. They take the ecosystem of a lake as a starting point to design systems that collectively make up a regenerative life support system. It means that every output of one part of the system becomes the input of another part of the system. Nothing gets lost. And that's, that's all beautiful and sustainable, but it's an, as essential if you want to survive on Mars, if you want to live there. But it's also a very good mindset for us on this planet if we want to keep it hab habitable. So, what is Astroplant? Astroplant is an open source, DIY, hydroponics based plant lab stuffed with sensors and a camera that collects data about how plants grow and sends that data to the European Space Agency, to the researchers, who use that data to make up models about plants and that can predict how plants grow under different circumstances. It's not a controlled chamber. We need the variety of data and the variety of circumstances in which those plants grow. Um, it's not just an app. It's, uh, it's, it's not just a kit. It's also um, an educational program and a citizen science program. We develop an app and a user experience for uh, uh, for kids, for students, for starting growers, and to raise the next generation of urban and space farmers. Uh, so far, we've developed a, a prototype. I see the font is, uh, has changed a bit, but we've developed a first prototype, and we're building a second prototype right now with a team of six engineers, designers, and a, and a biologist from Wageningen University. Um, and we're also developing the application. Uh, by the end of June, I have a few more seconds, we have a, we have a fundraiser, come on, <laughs> and we launch our first test phase with uh, 10 kits. Guys, we need you to be able to live on Mars and to feed the future cities on Mars. Meet us tomorrow at the AVF Cafe and let's join this mission. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harald Kozenza, and I'm CEO and founder at Robanica. So our startup, uh, we presented to the public people the first time last year as citizenships. Since then, between highs and lows and raising capital, which is difficult in Italy, we started doing pre-orders at Mega Fair and uh, Illuminotronica, which is a B2B event. And today, we are after an, a year, we are uh, ready to, to launch, and in September, we will deploy the first thousand machines. So the question behind the whole project is why? You know, everything is driven today by the price. And if price is the keyword, what happens is that biodiversity and, and quality are going to, to drop down. There is a problem, we think, in, in retail market. The quality is standard. It means you have to need a product every day for all, all, all year around in, in, in a standard quality. It has to need a long shelf life, which means that you need to turn down the nutritional values and, and everything. It's shipped in container, so you grow tomatoes and then you stock them in containers for months. Some of the guys before solved this problem by growing in cities. Our vision is to convert this model, so it's not the tomato that goes anymore from the farm to your table, but the, the product, it's grown where it's consumed, so right in your kitchen. Uh, our appliance is, of course, it's Internet of Things, it's connected, it's stacked of sensor, it's had a micro camera inside. We recall all the raw data, maybe one day we will be able to, to, to do something like image processing. Uh, today we're not able, the data is not enough, and it makes no sense to invest all, all the kind of money on this, on this thing. 
It's a worldwide project. We've been requested machines we pre-sold only in Italy, but we get requests from Canada and also Asia, uh, United States, and pre-order internationally will be available uh, starting from September. It has multiple applications. Uh, the first I not mentioned here is educational, as Mr. Despomier said. The problem is when kids discover the taste of lemon balm, they destroy your plants in like 10 seconds. So we have a consumer machine and we built a prototype of a B2B machine, which you can see here. The picture is not great. If you get out of the building, you see the real deal, which is much better. Uh, it's been to built to be beauty. We design it and we produce it and it will be made completely in Italy a part of the of the lab. Of course it's connected. You will have an app which monitors and records everything, which you can override the parameters to grow your, your plants. This is our catalog which we made uh, right now. Those are catalog of microgreens. You can come at the boot later and try them all. We have like 25 different species. We have all kind of crazy basils. In Italy we have many crazy basils which are not available on the shelf in, in retail market. We have crazy peppers from Sicily to Calabria and everywhere. We have tons of them. And we have of course all these spices. Uh, also leafy greens. We are growing different kind of leafy greens. The catalog is still in standing. Uh, all the guys before sell crops. We sell an experience. We give you access to an experience. Following step-by-step -step rules, you can make dishes which look like a professional chef. This is an example, thanks to Sarah, which made our chef, which made those, those plates. Uh, it's built with uh, our microgreens. This is an, an example of the kind of plates which you can do uh, simply following recipes. Uh, last but not least, I wanted to thank to all the partners which partnered with us to build the gigantic boot which you see outside, Paya for designing it, Synapse for building the software that runs our machine, uh, Isopan for providing all the insulating panel that we will use to build our own container because the project will scale up, Asodel Cathode for the optics, and BNB Marone and Arclinia for the amazing kitchen they gave us. So no matter what you grow, insects, plants, whatever you like, no matter where you grow, on rooftop, in the basement, wherever you like, the main point here is grow your own. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gabriella Funaro. I'm working for Enea. This is uh, the main research, Italian research center and I'm involved in a vertical farm uh, projects. Okay. Uh, I will start immediately with, uh, uh, an, an, I think, an important question. Can innovation and tech help us to feed a population of uh, over nine billions? Uh, we know that uh, uh, global food production uh, uh, we we'll need to scale up uh, in a big way, but uh, in a world uh, where there is uh, uh, very scarce uh, water, uh, fertilizer, and of course, uh, arable land. Uh, there is also the problem of the climate changes uh, that make uh, crop yields uh, unstable. We know that uh, uh, we produce uh, food um, a lot of food uh, uh, than ever before, but uh, our current model is uh, unsustainable. We need to radical change our um, food production. So uh, Enea answers to uh, the need for a new model uh, of a new agriculture by designing and uh, uh, implementing the first uh, Italian prototype of vertical farming uh, farm for uh, Expo Milano 2015. Uh, another question, uh, what changes uh, will cities uh, of the future face in feeding people? We know that uh, uh, cities are um, grow. Uh, the expansion of uh, urban areas uh, erodes uh, agricultural lands because uh, uh, we need uh, room for new buildings. Uh, so we have to think about the introduction inside the city of a food production which once was part of the city, but now uh, is, uh, in a, is undergone in a process of progressive exile. So uh, 
which one could be a good uh, uh, solution? For sure, urban agriculture. This is one of the most uh, uh, important strategies to solve uh, uh, such issues. And of course, uh, vertical farming is an in innovative uh, um, uh, food production for sustainable cities. But uh, thinking about uh, urban agriculture, there is uh, another consideration to do. Our cities are full of uh, former factories, of uh, railways, hospitals, of public buildings, which are not used anymore. Uh, think about uh, dismantled industrial areas uh, in Italy uh, are the 3% of, of all the Italian territory. And in Lombardy, where we are, uh, more than 700 are the dismantled areas. And in the city of Milan, uh, we have more than 200 buildings uh, that are not used anymore. And in Europe, oh well, also in Europe, we have more than 20,000 uh, buildings uh, that are uh, dismissed. So, what can we do? Enea is working very hard uh, thinking about the conversion of a factory, an industrial warehouse, barracks, uh, uh, public buildings, into vertical farm. I think uh, uh, we believe that is a valid use of, uh, uh, to utilize the structures that are no longer working for producing food. And these are uh, some projects that we are uh, doing uh, in uh, this last year. Okay, how to do this? Well, vertical farm system is probably the best way uh, and it's very easy to install in, uh, in uh, dismantled buildings. Everybody knows uh, how it works, so uh, artificial uh, lead lights, uh, soil, no, no soil at all, uh, only water and nutrients to grow our crops in total absence of chemical and pesticides. So I don't go on on a, a vertical farming system, but uh, it's sure that it's very easy to put inside a dismantled building and uh, we can have a new production. A re uh, we can revitalize the, the, the building. Uh, Enea is working also very hard uh, thinking about uh, mobile vertical farm in inside the containers. We talk uh, uh, about this uh, um, in uh, the other speeches. But uh, mm, we believe that is a very important instrument uh, also to, um, to disseminate information about uh, the new agriculture because uh, we have to um, uh, try to, mm, to think that uh, consumers are not uh, in confidence uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, this uh, the, the food, uh, the, the growing food inside the cities. And uh, uh, these mobile vertical farms we are easy to put everywhere. So we can really have uh, a new way to, to, to grow food. Uh, good, good morning, thanks for having me here. Bright Farms builds and operates local greenhouse farms to eliminate time, distance, and costs from portions of the food supply chain. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our worldview and our business model and then the technologies that we use. First, we only grow produce in the same markets where it will be consumed, and we only do this in deep partnerships with supermarkets on a commercial scale from a perspective of food safety, consistency, year-round availability, etc. We deliver an important set of values or benefits to supermarkets, and I'll sort of break that down into three ways. The first is that we're bringing access to mainstream supermarkets to a demographic that's hard for them to get to, which is millennials and the progressive eaters that want better for them and less processed foods. In America, uh, people have lost trust for big food brands. Local food is an anecdote to that, and we're giving big supermarkets a chance to reach the local food demographic. We're also bringing them produce that's about a week fresher than the produce that is competing with us from the West Coast, and we're also giving them surety of supply in a world of volatility from weather and climate that disrupts the traditional supply chain from the West Coast. We're currently operating with three commercial-scale greenhouse farms, 
one in Pennsylvania with the, uh, the chain Albertsons, the second in Washington, D.C. metro area with Ajo Delhi's, and the third in Milwaukee and Chicago with two divisions of Kroger. Now, when I think about the challenges of feeding our cities in the future, I'm actually not as concerned as some people are with running out of food. I actually think that over the next 10 or 15 years, you're going to see the consumption of meat decrease. We already see that in Europe and the United States. I don't think the developing economies will adopt the sort of the glutton meat consumption that we've got in the United States. I think they'll jump over it like they did from cell phones to landlines as they see the connection between people eating healthier, eating more plant-based diets, and feeling better, living longer, and being healthier. When meat consumption on a, on a percentage basis decreases over time, a great deal of capacity for food production will become available, both for grazing of, of cattle, but also for growing the row crops that are used to feed cattle in the industrialized nations around the world. I also think that food waste will continue to decrease. Europe, of course, is leading the way on this, but this is underway everywhere in the world. And food waste is food production waste also. So we'll see additional capacity develop from improvements in food waste also. So for these reasons and others, I'm not terribly worried we're going to run out of food, but I do think that where food comes from will shift. And if I think of a city like mine, New York City, I already see the retailers starting to seek alternatives to the West Coast supplies as an example of leafy greens because of the long distances, the complex supply chains, the volatility in weather and climate, but also the unsustainability of like the water cycle on the West Coast. So I do think you'll see higher costs uh, entering certain parts of the food supply chain, and you'll see different crops replacing uh, other crops and, and a lot of disruption, disruption happening, which I think would be good for the, the, uh, the innovators we're hearing from today. Briefly about our model, we grow in greenhouses. We don't vertically stack like a lot of uh, my colleagues here today. We, um, we rely primarily on the sun for the energy to grow our plants. For our needs, growing mainstream baby greens at commercial scale for supermarkets, we find that to meet our values and our economic targets, growing without electricity as the primary source works for us, less utility costs, less uh, fossil fuel consumption, less greenhouse gas emissions, and growing right outside of cities works for us as well. We don't compete with the urban population centers uh, for land use. We get right outside of a city center, plenty of land available, but still within tens of miles of the 100 to 200 stores we're satisfying from one of our farms. In conclusion, we've raised about $70 million total in the last five years. I've been running Bright Farms for six years now. We are operating greenhouses that are profitable, that are bringing supermarkets the freshest, tastiest, and most sustainable produce that's available. We are satisfying the needs of what we think are the nation's best supermarket chains in some of the nation's most important cities, and we're in the process of scaling up the nation's first national brand for local produce. Buongiorno. It's great to be here today at Seeds and Chips. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Gotham Greens, the company that I co-founded in 2009. We are a pioneering urban agriculture company headquartered in Brooklyn, New York City. Uh, this is the first commercial scale urban farm that we built and it was really has become an example of a successful commercial scale urban farm. People thought we were crazy when we conceived of this idea to grow like commercial farmers in one of the, uh, the world's densest uh, and most populated cities. But the vision came to fruition in 2011 with this greenhouse project, and now we've been able to successfully demonstrate that farming can be done in an uh, environmentally sustainable way as well as an economically profitable way um, in cities. Uh, we have now been able to scale up and have four commercial scale urban farms in two of the largest cities in the United States, New York City and Chicago. We employ about 160 employees and um, grow, last year we grew almost 20 million heads of leafy greens um, in 12 months. 
And so I think we've really been able to show people and demonstrate that this can be done. It can be something that uh, is, is profitable and sustainable. Um, we grow non-GMO, pesticide-free, leafy greens and herb products, which primarily come from the west coast of America, like Paul said, and they travel great distances to reach urban consumers, sacrificing quality, nutrition, and of course, have increased carbon emissions based on the long-distance transportation. So what we're able to do is provide our diverse customers, retail stores, supermarkets, restaurants, with this um, uh, farm fresh produce 365 days of the year. Why did we decide to do this? Many of the themes that we've discussed today. The vision was based on dwindling resources, greater population increase, as well as greater urbanization. As was noted earlier, by 2050, we're expected to be 9 billion people, and almost 60% of them will be urban dwellers. And that requires that food, once it's grown, harvested, and processed, has to be transported great distances into cities. So the first project that we built um, uh, is in Greenpoint. We built this on top of a bowling alley, and the reason why we did it on a rooftop was there was no land available in the city. There was no good quality soil, and very limited space. So we decided to use hydroponics, which can be very high yielding. It can increase yields up to 30 times based on conventional field agriculture. And we built this 15,000 square foot or 1,500 square, me uh, 1500 square meter project um, on top of an old bowling alley. Based on the success of this project, we partnered with um, a leading supermarket chain in the United States, Whole Foods Market, to build one of the world's first commercial-scale farms actually integrated into a supermarket chain. So consumers from that supermarket can get produce that was harvested every day, 365 days of the year, and simply brought down into the elevator. So this is also a very exciting project for us. Um, our third project was built on what at one time was the largest toy manufacturing facility in the United States. They used to make teddy bears and Rubik's Cubes, but this company went out of business in the 1950s, and this area uh, in New York and Queens is one of the most impoverished and economically distressed areas in New York City. By building this large-scale facility that's 60,000 square feet, we were able to bring almost 50 jobs to this community and a $6 million investment. And then we expanded to Chicago. We had had the success in New York. We said, why not go to one of the other largest cities in the United States? And we built this project, um, and we integrated with a company called Method that makes environmentally friendly soaps and cleaning products. So this was certified by the United States Green Building Councils as the lead platinum, the highest level of ecological sustainability in buildings, and is, um, um, uh, represents what 21st century manufacturing might be able to look like. This facility employs almost 60 people um, and now provides the leading retail stores in the Chicago market with farm fresh produce year round. So essentially what we've been able to do is build about two hectares worth of greenhouses in cities. It's still very, very small compared to the global greenhouse industry, but as we were demonstrating that this can be done in a profitable way and it can help revitalize urban communities, be uh, a representation of green building, ecological design, job creation, as well as connecting consumers much closer to the food where it's produced, get to know the farmer, and at the end of the day, have a very tasty, nutritious, better lasting product. Thank you. Come on. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're excited. This is exciting to be able to hear about all the different developments. Really want to be able to share some of our history. We've been one of the pioneers and leaders for indoor vertical farming uh, since 2004. We really want to highlight that these are complex things to do, understanding how to use biology, engineering, environment, how to bring that all together now with data science, and really redefine and transform agriculture in a new way. Uh, we're showing you a rendering of how we grow, things that make arrow farms unique. The arrow is talking about aeroponics, so we're actually misting the roots in a very targeted way. This is a way of growing that uses 95% less water, zero pesticides. It's also a way of growing in a much faster way. Uh, we actually have up to 30 harvests a year for baby leafy greens, which can be two or three times faster than what you'd have out in the field. So this is a way of growing indoors all year round in warehouses. There's no sun, there's no soil. Uh, the sun, we actually be able to deliver you know, through LED lights. But we want to share with you when we say no soil, this is the misting. This is what a healthy root system looks like. This is one of our uh, baby romaine lettuces, and this is the idea that we can be very targeted and very specific in terms of not only the water, 
but less nutrients, less fertilizer to be much, much more uh, judicious with our resources. At the heart, we're farmers, we're also technologists. The idea that when we've been growing exclusively with LED lights since 2009, this interaction, we can have more effective photosynthesis indoors to be able to drive and optimize that plant performance. So this is the idea of really understanding, again, how do we harness the environment, our systems, which is all proprietary and how we develop it, and then the biology. And it's really the people behind that's really bringing us to life. So what's exciting for us, we're a team of over 130 people. Uh, our plant scientists, crop physiologists, plant pathologists, our engineering, we have lighting engineers, mechanical engineers, industrial engineers. Uh, we have data scientists, we have nutritionists, we have microbiologists. We're thinking about the whole process very holistically to really redefine from seed to package how to deliver a better product, better tasting. It was exciting to hear about the focus on flavor. That's something that we're really highlighting as well. So we have an amazing technology that we've been working at since 2004, really developing. Uh, really want to highlight, though, a couple things about our company. It's really more important about how we do it as well. Uh, we're a mission-driven organization. We thought about all the stakeholders from day one, the environment. We thought about the community. We thought about really about how do we uh, partner closely with our customers. And then really our team. So we're really focused on how we transform agriculture by building and operating environmentally responsible farms around the world to nourish our communities with safe, nutritious, and delicious food. And our mantra is farming locally, globally. Our, we are a B-certified corporation. This is one of the highest marks, we think, in terms of social and environmental responsibility. We've also been part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, Circular Economy 100. How do we eliminate waste? We're looking constantly at every one part of our equation and what we're doing. Thinking about the theme, feeding cities, this is really about collaboration, right? Working with both federal, state, and down to the city level. Uh, working closely with the mayors. Uh, really thinking about what's at the heart of feeding cities. First and foremost, it's about how do we create jobs, year-round employment, fair wages, benefits. How do we think about revitalizing communities in terms of converting those abandoned spaces we just heard about? Over 200 just here in Milan alone. The idea that we can convert buildings and repurpose them, really drive economic development, is something that we're very much focused on. In Newark alone, we have four different farming operations. So just to highlight a couple quick things, uh, one of them is in a former manufacturing plant. It's a school farm. And the idea that we can actually bring the farm to the students, this is one of the things, how do we teach the future? It's been highlighted again, the future farmer, our future customer, they have an incredible connection with the food. And it's only fitting with President Obama coming today that we highlight that Michelle Obama has actually been to the school, has seen firsthand what we're doing, and is a big fan because, again, it's creating that connection. Uh, I want to highlight we've converted a former nightclub into an R&D farm. Uh, we converted a former paintball entertainment laser tag center uh, into a commercial farm. And then our biggest farm, our ninth farm that we're building out, is in a former steel mill. Uh, the steel mill is also going to be home to our global headquarters. We're in the process of just bringing it online. This gives you a sense of the scale and volume. And at the heart is growing beautiful product that's really well, been really well enjoyed by the community. Uh, we're helping lead the way in terms of the industry. We've gotten a number of awards, a little bit of press. Uh, and really what it is, it's about how do we raise awareness here about these issues. Uh, we're excited to be here and also announce a very strategic partnership. Uh, we are now part of the 100 Resilient Cities. We're a strategic partner helping cities think about what they do around resiliency for food. It's really important. I was really happy to share with the mayor before. Uh, Milan is one of the 100 Resilient Cities. So this is an opportunity to be able to collaborate, work closely. Uh, we have great financial partners to expand. We're looking to expand all over the world. And so please come visit us at uh, B32 to learn more. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. You can take it down. Okay. We're the last one. The last one. Yeah. I want to thank all of our speakers uh, for inspiring us today. We're out of time, so I'm just going to give you two quick takeaways, two action items. One, buy local food. When you buy local food, you support local farmers and you support the local food movement. You also support the technologies that improve the production of local food. And what that does is it'll improve the diversity and the quantity of local food available to you. So while it might look more expensive and more difficult now, it's going to make the local food movement easier and more sustainable in the long term. Buy local food. Number two, join the Association for Vertical Farming. We're the largest international organization inspiring collaboration and education in the new topic of vertical farming. We have over 80 members across the globe. We've been running for three years. And you can visit us at booth B38 at the AVF Cafe to learn more about us and talk about how we can help you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today.